Welcome to Audio Gyan with Kedar Nimkar, a podcast that documents insightful conversations with Indian designers, artists, musicians, writers, thinkers, and creatives of all types. Catch us on iTunes or visit audiogyan.com for more Gyan sessions. Here's your host, Kedar Nimkar. Louis Kahn once said, "A great building must begin with the immeasurable, must go through measurable means when it is being designed, and in the end, must be unmeasured." and what great opportunity to understand architecture in the area of education where i personally believe these thoughts would converge today i have vijay ramachandran with us on audio gan vijay uh, ramachandran and sunita kondor uh, are the co-founders of 100 hands it's a multidisciplinary design studio based in bangalore their work draws a keen sense of urban context by probing questions of scale character spatial and visual impact and remaking of the public domain 100 hands has designed a lot of public and education institutions nalanda university in bihar bangalore international center neve academy st andrew school and cmr university in bangalore to name a few we'll try and understand thoughts while designing or architecting educational institutes uh, institutions with bijoy today So thank you Vijay for giving your time and it's a real real honor to have you on audio gang. Thank you Kedar for inviting me. Uh I'm completely flattered that you would consider. I've seen your website and it's an incredible collection of interviews. So thank you for inviting me to to be oh, on it's, it's, on audio gang. I mean audio yeah, gang. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's totally my pleasure and honor. Uh so yeah, I've uh, as uh, I've come up with few questions and I wanted to understand the the a uh, thought process uh, behind ed- design designing educational institutions and also uh, through some of your work uh, and instances which you'll share but uh, i'm i'm hoping to have like a more uh, philosophical or an abstract conversation as much as i can and uh, to begin with if i if i can ask you like which out of five senses is the most critical while designing an education institute and if you can elaborate with why uh, or what according to you should be the key characteristics of a uh, educational institute as well so we can start by that and then like uh, um, take it forward well i think uh, yeah it's not really uh, about focusing on one particular sense uh, you know in terms of uh, either edu- educational institutions or architecture in general uh the real call to arms uh, is to try and see if there's a way to uh, give uh, you know a person who's experiencing the architecture a completely embodied experience so that uh, in fact it's not only the five senses uh, you know there are according to some you know uh, people there are 12 uh, senses you know also the sense of the body so that it's movement and balance and you know the sense of life the sense of touch but it's also the sense of the external world so in terms of temperature or in terms of taste and sight but also of the immaterial or the spiritual world the sense of thought the sense of speech the sense of ego uh um, and so what one is trying to do through uh when when designing and and making architecture is is to try to move away from the current predilection of making buildings purely to satisfy the eyes and try and make uh, architecture that is uh, a completely embodied experience where you you sort of engaged and all of your senses are heightened and this is true for educational institutions as well uh so it's it isn't one sense over the other but just a complete uh, sort of charge mm mm-hmm. and and then what uh, would be the key characteristics or is there any differentiator uh where where it it uh it gives like more prominence especially when you're designing like a educational space um yeah i mean it, it, based on 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 typology i mean uh, since you started with khan maybe we we can go back to khan uh, and when you know designing uh, the institute in amdabad uh, khan had you know historically written a lot about institutions or places of learning and talked about famously talked about the man under the tree exchanging realizations with uh, you know people 
and these exchanges between people are uh, you know completely egoless at least in the way that kan describes it so that the teacher doesn't know he's the teacher and the student doesn't know he's the student so it's like an exchange uh, between friends uh, where in that exchange then you see the world you know uh, and so really when designing an educational institution that's that's the kind of quality that one aspires to achieve uh, to design a space that uh, gives you um, a comfortable place in which to then you know engage with your compatriots with your friends with other teachers uh, and and to give you a, a variety of spaces to do it so that you know some people who are shy and who have you know more intimate connections with their friends uh you know have smaller spaces and there are those scales of spaces but also larger congregational spaces for the larger groups that you know may congregate and, and meet and exchange their ideas and so the great educational institutions i mean you know you see them as uh, as an architecture of participatory space of of this kind of really rich a variety of internal spaces comfortable uh, full of light and air Uh, and offering you uh, the possibility of chance encounters uh, and that i think is essentially uh, you know what we try to achieve in in educational institutions hmm 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 it 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 gives a nice uh, insight into my actually the next question which is very closely connected to what you mentioned about khan uh, that like if you can also highlight any maybe like give a few examples and uh help me understand as well because uh in my according to me like the the guru shishya parampara had uh, been like the focus uh, at least in the indian subcontinent and there uh, there was a clear differentiation between like a guru and a shishya yeah. and plus uh, uh, the architecture or the the seating arrangement or all those interactions were maybe under a tree as per <laughs> the the things which right. i have consumed uh, but in in historically has there been any milestones which made changes and then we landed up in this institutionalized uh, system uh, any any insights there which you can give uh, um i mean uh, yes uh, the, the the you know while going through your questions uh, the the first example that came to mind was uh, you know the the ancient uh, nalanda university plan itself yeah. um which uh, I, i don't know if you're familiar with the plan of the the university but it's basically a, a large courtyard and it's made up of this kind of archetypal form this very simple uh a square shape uh, in plan and uh, in the center of the square is a very large courtyard usually with some sort of a platform or a terrace or a temple or something in the middle of this large courtyard and circling uh, and circling this courtyard on four sides are cells where you know the 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 te- the students who'd come to study at the university would stay in these really small cells uh, almost in a sort of monastic way but uh, you know looking on to this central courtyard where instruction uh, and engagement with the tutors happen so it's a very very simple plan form but it it immediately tells you about that hierarchy that you're talking about about you know this uh, the the teacher and then the student and the plan then reflecting that relationship between uh, you know the, the the primary and the secondary sort of users in that space um but then uh, you know the, the times have changed a little bit and and uh, the other example that came to mind which is a little bit different from uh, you know from the nalanda plan is the plan of the management institute in bangalore which uh, vastu shilpa consultants though she's from uh, designed in the 70s and 80s and here of course the classrooms themselves are organized in that sort of hierarchical fashion it's a raked classroom with a you know a podium at one end where the tutor stands and imparts uh, his wisdom but i think the rest of the campus is what is really interesting for me and for a lot of architects who look at that building because it is like i said you know a, a campus filled with wonderful places for chance encounters for conversations for engagement and so of course there is the prescribed and formal education within the classroom but there is a world of learning that's awaiting you out uh, you know in the courtyards or in in the, in the small plazas or and so this rich exchange of the formal prescribed uh, and and very organized instruction inside the classroom and a very very sort of loose casual uh, and and wonderful uh, possibility outside so i think i am captures uh, that essential quality which uh, you know we are seeking um, 
and and little different from the nalanda plan in that sense Mm-hmm. I believe uh, I've seen some bits of uh, uh, houses from an architecture lens in in the Kokan mm-hmm. area of India, like uh, especially in the Maharashtra side. Right. And uh, you can see a similar structure where there's a center, there's a courtyard, and uh, uh, there are rooms spaced out, and it it helps in like good ventilation, good lighting system, good uh, communication between different rooms, and so on and so forth. Uh, so. is that uh and that changed over a period of time but uh, and that is because people started living in a different way and then nuclear families have uh, emerged so things have changed in that direction uh, is there any trajectory in the education space uh, which has changed because now it's it's like you see a different type of classroom and and structures altogether so uh, uh- yeah there is i mean of course uh, the the pressures on uh, you know campus building or the pressures on institutional buildings uh, you know like every other you know part of our architectural uh, you know typologies uh, there are uh, there are huge pressures in terms of land in terms of access to you know larger tracts of land to build large campuses and so this this idea of an institution as some sort of a sprawling campus where you have buildings spread apart from each other and very very sort of uh, lush gardens and when that notion of a campus is changing dramatically and today uh, we see schools and uh, and you know colleges uh, you know right in the heart of the city and so really the challenge is how does one still create a sense of that uh, you know of, of you know what we were talking about earlier of this kind of environment in a very dense urban lot where you know this uh, this institute may be coming up and so uh, there is that fundamental change because of the pressures of the real estate market and inability of the land uh, you know of large tracts of land and so uh, i think that's one major change uh, the other major change of course in in is in the way that instruction is being imparted and of course you know now in in the light of the current situation um i'm teaching in colleges and a lot of what we're doing is now happening online we're not meeting our students everything is sort of on on a small screen on my computer and i'm wondering what what that what that uh, you know means uh, going forward for architectural education where so much of our work needs to uh, inherently be about physical engagement to to see the site to to you know feel the environment uh, to get a sense of the environment etc and not being able to do that in this current situation and so how do you impart education about observation about you know speculation all of that without having physical contact and without being able to get out there so i don't know what what the future and man maybe this is all going to just blow over and in in a couple of months we'll be back to where we, we were fortunate or unfortunate but it does prompt questions about how uh, you would engage with people when physical uh, connections were not that easy to establish both with sites and with locations but also as people as as human mm-hmm. beings yeah even i sometimes wonder about that but there's one like famous uh, it's a it's a uh, line by like one of the greatest stand up comedians of uh, marathi he says that uh, those mm-hmm. who are learning uh, music say online uh, i mean i'm just mm-hmm. like taking liberty of the current context and uh, converting that but those who are learning music online probably will understand the history but not the mystery of the thing so i think <laughs> same will go uh, with uh, architecture if uh, if they don't get a sense of the surrounding and the the actual physical experience yeah yeah for sure i mean yeah it's an essential part of the education of an architect i mean to to really get a sense of the place where you because architecture by and large doesn't move around it's rooted in its location and so there is a lot to draw from uh you know from a from a particular place uh you know that informs architecture fundamentally um so uh, uh like taking that clue from uh, what you said uh, with, with doshi sir uh, he has designed certain uh, sections of the classroom uh, i wanted to just go deeper and also understand uh, what is the thought behind making like a teacher or a professor uh stand on a podium or like a slightly heightened surface i mean apart from mm. getting visibility at all the students which is like a more practical aspect i wanted to understand is there like some deeper psychological thing going on or 
uh, are there any insights where this has been proven ki this works better than some other things which have been experimented if you can share any insights there well i i'm not a not a real expert on on educational philosophy but yeah i think just common sense says that maybe uh, you know it was part of a belief that uh, you know instruction uh, like that top down where you know the teacher would stand on one end and was uh, supposed to know everything and the student uh, who doesn't know anything is sort of uh, at a at a lower level and so uh, you know you have that kind of a power equation between teachers and students and that you know probably is a is a good way to educate uh, people um uh, you you know we at one point in time when we were doing the neve academy at the same time we were also doing another uh, school that you mentioned in the introduction called st andrews and the two schools are really interesting for us to look at uh, in terms of plan and section and how they work so neve academy just in terms of its premise in terms of its uh, you know that the way that they wanted to uh, impart education they believe in a lot of the sort of casual encounters a lot of the sort of learning happening outside of classrooms uh, this really uh, you know uh, gelled with us and we were really keen on uh, on trying to find a way to express that in the architecture whereas in st andrews which is a much more conventional sort of school it's uh, you know classrooms and teachers just like you say you know with those sorts of power relationships between the teachers and classrooms for the longest time we really struggled to try and find a way to get the client to uh, agree to you know do a lot of the things uh, you know that we were interested in in terms of all of the spaces that would be outside of these classrooms and and places for this kind of casual engagement uh, but the two plans show uh, you know inherently the different approaches to education and so as architects of course we we have certain ideas about the world but we are also engaging with clients and we are also negotiating with our clients in finding a way to express what it is that they uh, you know uh, hold as as uh, sacred in terms of how they want to engage with their students in terms of the spaces that they will use and so it's lovely to see these two plans both you know completely different uh, ways in which to instruct students and the plan then reflecting that sort of difference in terms of philosophy and instruction so i think i i don't have a, a way to say which one is more successful than the others i think it also depends on the students themselves certain people thrive in environments which are much more uh, you know regimented and and uh, where instruction is completely sort of uh, top down and some kids thrive in environments which are completely open uh, and flexible and so I I don't know whether I can generalize whether one plan works better than the other for everyone. Mhm. Very interesting. Making it like much more um uh, yeah yeah I got what you're thinking. Uh so when you are when you're designing uh, these uh, projects uh, like design designing especially institutional uh, structures uh what right. are like the critical uh, issues or elements that you deal or you consider or you prioritize uh, are there any guiding principles and obviously there are what yeah, if you can share those <laughs> uh yeah we've touched upon quite a few for educational institutions i'll talk a little bit about public institutions or public uh, sort of shared institutions in the city because we've done uh, you know recently worked on a, a project uh, called the banglo international center which is a public institution Correct. and in fact getting into it we we won a competition in 2012 so a long time ago and uh, as the basis of that competition entry what we were trying to express just like in educational institutions here our main agenda was to try to express the public life of this uh, of this building how do you express publicness or public uh, you know the public aspirations of this institution through architecture and so our competition entry and and of course the building that's been built now has a large number of open shared uh, spaces between all of the program uh, that is free to uh, interpret so the people who run the building they had all kinds of events in these uh, you know common spaces from exhibitions to story selling telling sessions to uh, dance performances so completely flexible open space that's between all of the program so the auditorium the restaurant all of that sort of is on the side of this very large amount of public open space and so this becomes then the life and expression of the publicness of the building a place to engage a place to congregate a place to see other people 
and and know that you know you're part of this large community so the building sort of encapsulating the agenda of this uh, institution uh, in in a, in an architectural sense so that's uh, both in terms of educational institutions and public institutions and this is probably true for architecture as well at the start of a commission you're asking that question about the nature of things you know as khan would call it uh, you ask the fundamental question of what is a school or what is a public institution and that that then is is something that's uh, apart from the physical context of your site apart from the understanding of climate or the client or his budget or the site it's an understanding of uh, sort of how people operate in an institution how people operate in an educational space how they operate in public space and you're trying to come to some understanding of those expressions architecturally you're looking at precedents and so that's happening side by side to an appreciation of the physical context that you're encountering and so rather than a, a sort of generalized uh, set of characteristics you're asking specific questions about the commission about this typology or about you know uh, the ambitions of your client in in sort of very very uh, broad terms um, so yeah i i think that that kind of uh, sums it up for us this idea of of the nature of things and 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 a close observation of the physical context both coming together to then inform uh, what the building is mm-hmm. but um, so in in one of your talks i think uh, tedx uh, somewhere i had uh, heard about you also speak about change uh, or set time and what you're saying is also it changes Uh, as you go along so when when uh, the bic was designed maybe the things were different and now things are different and then again if if i connect this to the education space uh, like how open this architecture has to be or how closed or like what what is guiding the overall theme because your uh, metaphorically also and and practically as well change is like almost there because you are every batch of student who's coming every year uh, is is driving change and in that talk you you speak about change in in a short term while also giving like a like a longer perspective of change as well so i was trying to understand what like your thought process there and uh, essentially like architecture aging with time but uh, also giving birth of a like of a new generation on an almost yearly basis so how do you like reconcile this or how does that guide in the thought process well it's a it's a really good question this notion of typology also i mean you're basically fundamentally questioning uh, you know what is typology in that context uh, you know because because inbuilt into and and we are seeing that uh, in fact uh, you know play out uh you know our notions of how you educate people or how you congregate or how you know this idea of the collective the idea of how we see ourselves as society is something that's uh, constantly being redefined and reorganized and so how does architecture reflect that flux um so i have i have uh, of course you know there are two examples when i was working in uh, in boston years ago uh, with a wonderful architect called fred porter we were doing a master plan for uh, the city of toronto for uh, you know the the port lands in toronto and the building type he he def- he uh, you know come up with this kind of building type and he done this analysis of the back bay in boston which is a 19th century development on on reclaimed land on the charles river uh, and it's a very very simple uh, uh, development of uh, mostly row houses uh, and uh, these houses have a certain dimension height and and width and a certain structural uh, sort of cadence and he said that these buildings were a wonderful example of a typology which could work for housing it could work for an office it could be a place where you could do a studio and so inherent in that uh, basic structure of the building was this robustness and and uh, ability to change that it could just be reinvented every time uh, you know you had some fundamental change in the way the markets were working that these buildings were able to cope up with those changes without having to be demolished and so using that as a type just in terms of its dimensions uh, we started thinking of these new buildings on the portlands to be buildings like that that had this incredible resilience and robustness that they would last for centuries without having to be completely altered or changed or demolished to accommodate new uses 
So that's one example. The other example, of course, is again, uh, you know, though she's building uh, the management institute in, in Bangalore. And, and what's beautiful about that building is that it talks about time in a very sort of meta metaphorical way. Uh, if, you, if you see the plan of IIM Bangalore, it's a series of these very, 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 uh, you know, impressive triple hide uh, walkways. They're large passages with pergolas on top filled with landscape. And these uh, pathways actually are the, are the main armature on which the institute is actually uh, you know, all of the building, all of the program of the institute are actually plugged onto this armature. This armature is uh, is incredibly, uh, uh, you know, architecturally incredibly powerful. It's memorable. So everybody who goes into IIM remembers these, uh, you know, very, very sort of strong, uh, the strong language of these architectural armatures. And so what Doshi is doing is something very clever. He's setting up the system, which, you know, is is very, very large. It is very flexible. And, and over time, what has happened is that IIM has built numerous new buildings, you know, after the 70s and 80s, they've built a lot of, uh, you know, new facilities that have plugged onto this armature that Doshi set up. And so what, what happens is that, of course, the institute is constantly, uh, you know, growing and changing, but the memory and the image of the institute doesn't change. So the identity of this place remains constant because of this armature that he's built. And it's something that harks back to, you know, Alison Smithson's idea of the mat building where you set up a framework or an armature which contains all of the circulation and some of the services and then plugged onto this armature are all of the programs which, you know, you add on over time. So that may be one idea of how institutions could be design, designed. Of course, keeping in mind the limitation of space, I don't know how you, how you take that forward, but the IIM is a great example of something that has retained its quality in spite of, uh, you know, change over time, which you can't say for many, many projects, you know, where over time things sort of get mutilated. Wow. Now I'm, I'm able, because I, I'm not like a architect, but uh, I can, I can slightly connect how grand this vision is of while designing what, what must have been going on. It's, it's really fascinating. I think that I think the management institute. I mean, in my mind, is is sort of the the great masterwork. It doesn't. Uh, I mean, it doesn't get a lot of. Of course, after the Pritzker, now uh, you know all of his work has got a lot of uh, you know newfound uh, attention. But I think the management institute, in for me, sort of encapsulates the quality of a really modern and yet completely connected to our history. A building that's completely sort of from here. You know, a really truly uh, local, truly you know, powerful Indian architecture. Yeah. Uh, and so what can be like the big difference while, because you have done both, right? You have like designed an university as well. And also like a Neve Academy, which is like, yeah, primarily like a school. So mm -hmm. any, any mm -hmm. fundamental difference there? Uh, and, and this is mainly to understand because you're like dealing with different type of users, like the school might have like children, uh, and and then uh, space has a completely different meaning when when it comes to teenagers, um, and also mm. uh, and 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 if you can also highlight any observations which you have seen that people start using this differently because uh, I've done a couple of uh, interviews with uh, some students from NID uh, who had designed certain spaces but uh, like the 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 differently able use it differently the the children start using it differently. So, uh, any any um, observations there? Um, yeah, actually, again, I mean, not to, uh, you know, keep talking about I am, but there is one criticism that, you know, when we started working on uh, the Neve uh, school, our Neve client, you know, came for our first meeting and it was, Kavita is an incredibly sort of, uh, you know, astute observer of things. And at the first meeting, she asked me, you know, what my favorite building was. And I, I said, you know, I am Bangalore without batting an eyelid. And she said something that really sort of shook me up a bit. You know, she said, see, every time I've been to I am, and it is a fantastic, you know, piece of architecture, it really moves you, it heightens your senses, all of the rest of it. But almost every time I've gone there, the spaces are underutilized, you know, the spaces that you talk about for congregation, for people to come together, for interaction the institute always looks empty. And so 
the question really is also about the conversation that one has as an architect with with you know your own uh, sort of uh, uh, ambitions uh, your own ego your thinking about uh, this in the abstract but you're also having the important conversation with the client and how he plans to run the institute so when talking about the difference between an institute like a college and a school i think that's a that's a big difference between you know the way people see a college running the kind of environment that it needs to have the kind of activities that you know they imagine in a college versus the kind of things that a school like neve will have you know for for interaction and for engagement uh, and so the the answer to your question i mean it's a bit long winded but the answer to your question is to go back to that reference of st andrews and neve that you have to sit with the client and you have to find out how they imagine the the public life of these buildings how do they imagine you know uh, you know people using a lot of these spaces and sometimes like at i am if there is a disconnect between how you know the management thinks about using the building and 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 trying to enhance these spaces you know that have been designed they just go unused and so in in places of higher education sometimes you see that that this grand ambition that the architect had sometimes they go to naught because uh, you know the institute doesn't really operate like that this is not true you know to a large extent with schools invariably the kids will appropriate whatever you know space that you provide so in fact in st andrews you know when you go back now to see the place we had left these uh, gardens between the classrooms which you know for the longest time we had to fight with the client about but now when we go there those gardens are incredibly well used by the kids and it's you know the classrooms actually open out to the gardens and i remember having these conversations of why would we need to open out to the gardens you can get to the gardens from the corridor and now of course that connection has really served the kids really well because they can just get out from the classrooms directly into these gardens and use it and so kids invariably find some you know interesting ways in which to use all of these you know spaces that one designs in colleges it it becomes less of that because you know older you know kids have different priorities uh, and they have other things to do so then it becomes a a, a condition where maybe there needs to be uh, some sort of a structure that then uh, you know makes these spaces alive or, or makes them uh, useful correct 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 and and um, again i've seen interior but uh, has it does it happen in architecture that you've designed a space uh, say for a school but then they have they have uh, graduated to open up like a college as well and then you need to make some architectural changes so does that happen uh, and then if it then what what could be the yeah uh, gradual progression i don't know what up this could be like a really dumb question but i just wanted to understand um i don't have specific uh, uh, you know experience of that but of course uh, our bangalore international center has been an incredible exercise for us in managing change in just change management as they call it in the in the you know in architectural circles that over the course of these 7 years that we worked on the project uh, from you know completely different scheme for the competition to where we landed at the end the building has gone completely sort of uh, you know has has fallen on, has has sort of completely been reinvented in the, in those conversations with the client of course while we were in the throes of it and and sort of managing all of these disparate voices that were coming at us uh it was really tough and frustrating and you know often times we would you know just consider maybe you know we should get out of it now because it's just taking too long and and we're not going anywhere but now when you look back at it and and think of this really sort of uh, engaged client a real sort of uh, you know uh, evaluation of what is important for the for the public institution we see that these conversations actually all of these conversations and the involvement of the client and this real engagement has turned out to be you know the the great benefit of this process that the building has really become a sophisticated reflection of that collaboration between a client and an architect which is not often the case and so in every way that they use the building now you see uh, you know the benefit of that engagement that because we spoke about it at such in such detail and looked at it with with such careful eyes that we were able to to preempt all of the different ways in which they could 
use this building it's a very small building and yet you know there is so much uh, possibility there in terms of how you can use it and so i think this idea of change uh, and the idea of how the building can grow and 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 accommodate change is is also a factor of how closely you are having this conversation with your client and how uh, sort of without ego both of you the client and you are coming at it so that you're trying to figure out you know at least to some extent how you can accommodate change because change is coming and and you know you need to sort of preempt that uh, through these conversations wow i'll try and yeah, it's it's very inspirational because uh, like in in like i i i sometimes tell my uh, friends uh, like in in the next birth i would like to be an architect because uh, currently i'm dealing with ui and user experience and digital designs so so even if there is like change every second i can still deal with it because it's finally like moving of pixels and stuff around and changing something in the code uh when it it when it comes to architecture or building bridges and like that sort of a infrastructure it's it's really tough uh, and like the definition of change completely changes uh when you are dealing with such massive things so yeah um uh, yeah it's also a question of ego actually kedar i mean i think the the uh, unfortunately the way that uh, you know we are educated as architects you know through the five years uh, architects are educated so that they believe that the great idea comes from the individual that somehow sitting in a dark room you know you can then churn up all these wonderful ideas for architecture and the moment you come out of architecture school you realize that this is a complete fallacy and that great things actually happen through consensus and negotiation and all of that messy stuff that you don't really get exposed to in 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 college and so how you deal with that and how you sort of let go of that ego where you're sort of listening and really sort of trying to absorb what the client is telling you or what the site is telling you or there are so many things coming at you from all over the place that you really be op- need to be open to to those stimuli because that will improve the project at the end uh so yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> a nice segue i have like last uh, two three questions uh, you spoke about stimuli just now uh, i wanted to understand and this is also like one of my friends uh, kids uh, is in neve academy so if i want if you can take that example and uh, just give like a context of how much like environment uh, in general uh, the natural and the built up uh, fx learning and like how do you create one if i know it's a it's a very longer it will have a, like a very longer answer because that could independently be like a different audio gan but if you have to briefly talk about uh, how much like environment affects learning um i i think environment is uh, is really important uh, of course it also means that you know whoever once you finish the building and handed it over to you know whoever is running it that they then capitalize on on the things that you've done so that you know they they help in in uh, you know in the way that uh, you know they're teaching the kids we had a wonderful uh, landscape architect on neve a, a person called varna dhar who's a local architect here in bangalore and of course in the architecture itself the choice of different materials for the floor the kind of structure that you know the building has the story of uh you know the, the the floating roof and the memory of this coconut orchard these are all uh you know things that we tell uh, the students so in fact at neve uh, every year uh, we haven't been doing it for the past couple of years but every year kavita would call us back to neve to speak to the second standard students to tell them about the story of the design and how we came up you know with this particular design what the the main uh, you know uh, concepts were etc and so at a very young age the ch- kids are already exposed to you know talking about materials about structure about you know bending moment and it's really interesting and and very challenging communicating with the young kids but what's really interesting about those conversations is particularly to do with the landscape and the way the water there's a small water channel and what varna did at neve is to make three or four different kinds of gardens here so there's a garden that you know particularly attracts butterflies the water tank itself has you know a whole bunch of uh, you know frogs and and other you know fish and things like that so 
every environment in every one of these gardens and 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 this water body there are all places where you know the kids are taken out by this by the teachers and then they they're instructed just to see what kinds of you know what the plant inventory is why they've been planted in that particular way uh, you know the north garden has a certain kind of plant uh, inventory the south garden has something else and 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 so in in seeing and being in that environment and and being exposed to it every day you imbibe these qualities that otherwise you know you don't you don't have in an environment that isn't designed as carefully so varna really i mean more than the architecture i think the landscape is really sophisticated and one can spend hours sort of just talking about all of the choices that she's made with regards to the landscape and and the various uh, you know landscape moves in that small campus mm-hmm. and any other angle to it apart from material and uh, i mean there are different dimensions as well like sound and other uh, senses uh, is- yeah oh. there's sure yeah there's there's a lot of psychological uh, conditions as well which uh, you know we were very careful to make sure so there are there are maybe you know maybe three or four different kinds of scales in neve so you know you have of course the classroom which is the basic module of that building and that has been very carefully designed so that it isn't too tall and we have kids up to the fifth standard so there's a little bit of variation between you know these uh, these kids uh but the classroom is one kind of module and then you have uh, next to the classrooms you have uh, places for maybe smaller groups to uh, uh, congregate so there the height is slightly different and then there's the public spaces of this building which you know have a much taller height where maybe larger congregations etc can and uh, can come together then there are the gardens which are you know lush thick uh, you know tropical gardens where again there's a different scale and a different quality of enclosure so one is one is playing with these enclosures because what you're trying to do is basically give the teachers of course different environments in which to then engage with different sizes of uh, of kids but you're also giving kids the opportunity to find the place that they're comfortable in to to then operate to to engage with their friends uh you know to to feel comfortable because different kids have different requirements and so the building gives you all of these uh, sort of opportunities to find a place that then uh, is comfortable for you to learn even in the library you have you know spaces where uh, there's a little bit more height so that maybe the larger group the big reading table is in that part of the library but then you also have nooks and and smaller environments for the kids to then you know find a book and just go into a nook and and do a very sort of personal reading and so i think as uh, schools are great fun in that sense because they give you the opportunity to do all of this you know to to play with the scale and section of the building to create moments of a large congregation but also moments of uh, intimate refuge mm, brilliant brilliant um cool and and uh, so bijay you you spoke about like lot of um, other aspects as well like ego and so and i'm very inspired by just listening to what what we are just having a conversation on um i wanted to and this is like a further abstracted question mainly at design as a concept at large so apart uh, apart yeah. from like understanding the the architecture or the the that particular skill uh, what other expertise do you think uh, you need in order to uh, grow as a designer like a design design uh, in not a cliche sense but like as a problem solver or like as a space creator um and also in the institutional section now not necessary education but generally uh if you can share that as well it would be great because uh i've i've heard the the other talks as well and it's very inspiration to understand where you come from so if you can share that <laughs> hmm. well uh i think the uh, at least you know for me um observation and uh you know documentation of some sort are are critical skills as as a designer i think for for me to be able to observe and to really sort of assimilate uh, you know the conditions that make the work possible so uh, everything from the physical conditions that you're confronted with to just be able to uh, observe and catch uh, you know there's a wonderful example for this uh, great architect from uh, bangladesh a guy called rafiq azam uh, you know he uh, would spend i don't know he you know people would come to his office and they, they they'd ask him to do a house or whatever and 
he would tell them that he's very busy and he can only do it six months later, etc. And you know, he'd get all the details from them. And of course, people would wait because he's a he's a really good architect. But what Rafiq would also do in the time that uh, you know he had now, he had six months before he would start anything on this project. But he would try and go to the site often to try and absorb and assimilate all of the conditions that are particular to that location. And so this real observation of something then informs uh, or, or results in a much more sort of sensitive form of speculation that you're really understanding, the, you know, all of the myriad things that may come into play uh, for a project. And so I think that's an essential skill, which I think gets short shrift because we just don't have enough time to do that in, you know, day to day practice. And so we have to figure out or invent ways in which to sort of carve out some time and Rafiq's uh, example, of course, not all, all architects have clients waiting for them for six months. But if you had that wonderful opportunity, then make the, use, make the best use of it and try to spend additional time looking at things. Uh, so when students come and, you know, they ask, uh, you know, what, what would you advise? And I always tell them that try and just bunk all your classes and, and get out and travel as much as you can. And, and while traveling, just try to to draw or to write whatever comes to you while you're in those places because when you revisit those drawings and those notes and the writing it'll bring back exactly you know what you felt and what you sensed when you visited these places and that then brings back you know a whole not only the physical sort of you know experience of being there but all of the psychological and sort of metaphorical meanings that you drew when you visited you know these places and so travel and this idea of observation, I think, are essential to us. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. Cool. Uh, on the concluding note, if I have to just, uh, this is like my favorite part, like if you have to visualize like an educational institute, say like 20, 30 years out in the future, uh, with, with the current pandemic, it's a different story. This will... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, in a, in a traditional sense, where do you think, um, uh, have you have you thought about it, like envisioned anything where it could go? Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, I, I have uh, seen this one project, you know, by, the, it's a, I can't remember now the name of the student, but she was a Spanish student who uh, was, uh, you know, who did a project in Ahmedabad. And, uh, of course, it, it wasn't an institution, I don't think. It was some sort of a bunch of community buildings or something. But what she'd done is she'd taken the old city of Ahmedabad, uh, somewhere around Manik Chowk, and she had uh, decided to try and find all of those uh, sort of uh, wasted spaces or interstitial spaces, a little corner of the street where nothing had, you know, had been built. And she had made this uh, kind of collection of buildings that were basically appendages to the existing context. And she had carved out all of these places for, you know, people to sit and work or people to, you know, sell something or, I mean, a, a, a whole series of little additions and alterations to the existing fabric. And I think going to the, you know, looking, I don't know about architectural instruction or how you will teach or education, you know, I don't, I don't know the, the, the trajectories for those things. But architecturally, I think this idea of a uh, of, of, uh, of engaging with what already exists because someone said that you know the most sustainable building is something that's already been built that already mm -hmm. exists uh, and so to, to think of architecture or to make to, to think of the new institutions as appendages or as as sort of clever uh, re uh, revitalization of an existing fabric I think is 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 probably the way that we should be thinking of things that you know how do we how do we cleverly appropriate, uh, you know, uh, air, air, you know, the, the, the space above buildings? How do we cleverly appropriate, uh, you know, the interstitial spaces that are between buildings to create then maybe very temporal additions that, you know, you could occupy for a few, uh, you know, days of the week, other days of the week, you make something else. So this kind of an ephemeral architecture is what I'm thinking would be very interesting to think of. Um, hmm. Yeah. yeah, if I can take the liberty of saying that, I think this is coming from your like uh, humble approach towards looking at reality. Because even in the camera, since they say, which is the best camera, the best camera is the one which you have at that point in time. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's more real to the real world. Uh, so you have structures, yeah. you just 
you just utilize them to the best appropriate and, yeah. Them. Yeah, appropriate yeah, them. Yeah. yes this is of course completely in contradiction to what we are taught in in architecture college because in architecture college we constantly talk about you know this idea of permanence this idea of robustness this idea of uh, you know a uh, timelessness that you have to build this uh, you know institution in in that image and i am talking about something that will not last for that long it's something that you can deploy very quickly that's something that is completely ephemeral uh, and so i yeah it's a bit of a i'm i'm yeah interested <laughs> in that it's yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. to think yeah cool i think uh, on this note obviously there is nothing like uh, we can have this conversation if i am capable enough to keep asking it it will be like just an ongoing endless conversation to there's so much to know more about architecture and your uh, philosophy as well uh, but yeah we'll we'll conclude on this note uh, you can visit uh, 100hands.com to read uh, and know more about uh, vijay's work and like overall the projects I also want to uh, thank Ruturaj Parekh from Matter Studio, uh, Studio Matter, uh, Matter dot in, from Goa, uh, for helping me with this uh, audio again. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Vijay, a lot for giving your time. It was really inspiration, uh, like an inspirational talking to you. And uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Kedar. It was really nice. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Thanks. And that's it from today's Gyan session. Catch us on iTunes, Savan, Stitcher, or any podcasting app you use. Do rate us on iTunes and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Stay tuned for more Gyan on AudioGyan.com. Till then, bye.